Hello everyone and welcome to part three of our series of webinars for hospitality businesses. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today, particularly given it's such a, a scorching hot day out there. Um, hopefully some of you are able to join us from your gardens whilst enjoying this uh, short heat wave. I'm Kevin from Plan Day. I'll be moderating the session today. We've got another fantastic lineup of speakers, all handpicked to give you some further insight, tips, and advice for this ever-changing landscape in which we're we're operating. Um, just to to set the scene and provide some context for the session, particularly for those who haven't joined us before, we held the first one of these this series back in in april and that was all about kind of braving the storm what can you do to support your staff and optimize your systems during lockdown then we moved on to that that kind of middle period um, i think it was end of may beginning of june and when we held part two and that was really when businesses were were desperately trying to stay afloat and we talked about using government support and different ways to adapt offerings in order to, to generate some revenue while sites were closed and, and many staff were on furlough. So now, just over a month now since, since businesses were allowed to reopen in the UK, we feel it's a good time to, to, to bring another team of speakers together and focus on really that, that kind of new operating model what can we do differently now with reduced capacities indoors with a potential dip in, in consumer confidence um, while still having to be mindful of a, of a potential second wave or localized lockdowns what's going to make businesses profitable and how can we future proof our offering moving forward that's the focus for today so the speakers joining me are Christian from Tenzo. We've also got Sharon from Hasty, Claudio from Deliverect, and Carl from HFTP. That stands for the Hospitality, Financial and Technology Professionals. They will join me today to discuss the, the current trends and, and the concept that, that we're calling business as unusual. Um, can I just have the next slide, please, Don? So just to quickly introduce myself, as I said before, I'm Kevin. I work for Plan Day as partner manager for, for the UK and Ireland. For those of you that don't already know Plan Day, we provide a, a software platform which helps restaurants, cafes, bars and hotels uh, to manage their staff more effectively. So people use Plan Day to to manage their staff, rotors, timesheets, HR, communications, payroll, etc. We just make things super simple, modern, and accessible on, on any device. We do a lot of interesting work with, with partner organizations, such as those joining me today. And together, we offer a, a complete and, and fully integrated suite of, of technology to help hospitality operators to optimize their businesses. And that's something I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss during the webinar and, and hopefully during the Q&A today in terms of how technology might be even more prevalent in, in the post-lockdown landscape. Can I have the next slide, please? So if we look at today's agenda, which we've split into three model, modules uh, and then a Q&A, We'll kick off with Christian from Tenzo. Um, he'll talk us through what we know from, from a data perspective. What are the, the current trends and, and the near future picture? Once he's set the scene, I'll be joined by two further speakers who will give us some advice on what we can do now. Um, firstly, we'll have Sharon with some advice around what we can do for our staff or our, our people and then Claudio from a, from a more operational perspective. Then we'll have Carl, who will take us through the, the current landscape from a, from a customer experience perspective and what's now expected in that sense. 
And finally, we'll be taking your questions and offering advice and guidance where we can. And on that note, if I can just have the, the next slide. Um, so we're using a tool called Slido today. Um, some of you may have used it before. Um, it enables you to ask us questions. Um, you don't even have to think of your own question. You can see everyone else's um, and vote on those that you would like to be answered. Um, gives us a way to prioritize those, those most popular questions. Um, just open up a, a new tab on your browser or use your phone if that's easier and just type sly.do. That will take you straight to the event code box. The hashtag will, will already be there, so just type business as unusual and then you can ask questions and keep an eye on what's going on. If I could just have the, the next slide, please. So I'd like to welcome Christian back again by popular demand. Um, Christian is CEO, co-founder of Tenzo and an ex-restaurateur himself. Hey, Christian. Um, Hi, Kevin. This is the third time that, that, that we've done this together. So, so I know Christian will have some, some really great insight for us all using both the, the data from his own system, but also looking at what we can learn from, from other countries. Um, Perhaps before you go into that, Christian, you can just give us a quick background on yourself and, and maybe explain Tenzo in a, in a few words for those who don't already know. Amazing. Thanks, Kevin, for having me again. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Christian, uh, co-founder of Tenzo. Um, I Previously to, to Tenzo, I had uh, set up a chain of restaurants after uh, studying computer science. So computer scientist turned restauranter. And the thing that was driving me crazy when I was running my chain of restaurants was how hard it was to get. Uh, data in the hands of my GMs uh, to help them make uh, the decisions on the day-to-day, -day, how much staff to have, how many, how much food to order in, etc. I was spending a ton of time downloading data from various systems like the staff schedule and the point of sale to put it into an Excel and uh, and spend most of the time doing that as opposed to uh, trying to like get people to engage with it. No one wanted to engage with it. So Tenzo is this tool that connects to all these data sources and automates all of that to, to, so that you just can spend the time looking at the data, not having to put it together. And today I've put together a few slides just to run you through a little bit about what's been happening uh, in the last few weeks in terms of uh, uh, how, how things are coming back for the restaurant industry. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd love to answer any of your questions at the end. So um, if we could go to the next slide, Dom, please. So a, a couple of uh, main points I'd like to address today. So uh, one is around reopening numbers for the first month back, uh, and obviously also about talking about eating out to help, uh, help uh, eating out to help out, and also lessons from abroad, uh, from from mostly from the from Asia, as um, they are a few months ahead of us. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So we've been tracking from the beginning of the of the pandemic 127 locations uh, in the UK to see how many of those uh, were operating how many closed uh, what uh, how what their growth rate had changed by to get a bit of an idea of what uh, the impact on the industry and as you can see right at the beginning um around the end of of March uh, when the government recommended people don't go out to restaurants but didn't close them. Uh, the number of locations started closing, uh, so you went from 127 down to um, 53. And then once the government imposed the, the lockdown and asked all restaurants uh, to close, that went down to, an, to 21. And that was the lowest, well, 20 was actually the lowest point. Um, and that was because some restaurants stayed open for the duration for delivery only. Uh, and that's throughout the, 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 the pandemic and the lockdown has grown steadily. Uh, it's got, gone, gone up by more than two and a half times in that period. And that was mostly because uh, we believe restaurants started seeing, okay, maybe there is uh, some business to, 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 to be done, uh, in particular on delivery. Um, and that jumped at, the, at the, the week of the 29th of July, which is where the uh, 29th of June, sorry. Um, where the Saturday was the 4th of July, obviously. So that jumped up to, to 81 and that's been growing uh, gently since. So uh, we're about 
70% back open, which is in line with what we saw uh, in Asia, where two thirds of restaurants reopened about uh, a, a month after the, the, the lockdown was over. So if we could go to the next slide, please. And we, we, we also track like for likes to get a bit of an idea of how were the, the, the locations that were open uh, trending. And uh, that obviously fell off a cliff at the beginning, in particular when uh, the government was saying that they couldn't close, the restaurants couldn't close, but people should are recommended not to go. So obviously, like for likes were down 70%. Uh, and that jumped back up uh, for the restaurants that were still open and doing delivery. Some of them saw higher numbers than they usually would have um, at, at that time of year. So, um, and as more opened, uh, the, the, the like for likes fell. Uh, that has come back uh, quite significantly, uh, especially the week of the, the 3rd of, uh, of August, we'll see that we're now at minus 12. Um, uh, clearly, the eating out to help uh, to help out has helped tremendously, and we'll go a bit into more detail there. But uh, overall, uh, we had seen 70% down, then a period around like the 30, 40%, and then now back to 12, uh, back down 12%. If we could go to the next slide, Don, please. Uh, and we wanted to look out uh, at a bit the impact of uh, eating out to help out. Uh, the, the numbers we saw published today is that, that 10 and a half million meals were um, discounted by the by the government scheme. Um, so that's a huge a uh, huge boost to, to the industry. And you could see that um, our numbers were showing that about 10 percent more restaurants were open. Uh, on Monday 3rd than on the previous Monday. So uh, definitely more restaurants opening to take part of this, a, a, a huge amount of chains taking part of it, uh, and, and generally has been a pretty successful um, first week for it. Uh, they said that the 50 million pounds was distributed in the first week and that the um, the treasury had earmarked 500 million pounds for, for the duration of this. So uh, pr pretty pretty good first week. If we could go to the next slide, please. I'd like to now talk a little bit about what uh, lessons that we could see from abroad. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. And in particular, um, we've run a podcast over the past uh, few weeks talking to uh, restaurateurs in Singapore, in Thailand, uh, in China and Hong Kong to get a little bit of a sense of what has happened during the lockdown and, and, and after the lockdown and how things have come back. And I'd just like to share some of the some of the lessons that that have come out from that. So if we could go to the next slide. So there's four four key points I wanted to to, to talk about here. Um, delivery is still seeing most of the sales. This is post the lockdown. Um, people have definitely shifted uh, to delivery. We're seeing that a lot more people are, are taking this up, and that uh, is staying. That is not something that is now going. So so. Delivery is still something uh, worth investing in if you haven't done so now uh, for, uh, for for the immediate future, but also in case there is a, a local lockdown or a second wave. The second point is really around like uh, lessons around operations. So um, we spoke to a couple of people who had uh, decided to run their teams where they would split them in two groups so that these two teams would never work together. Uh, so that in case one team got affected, they wouldn't infect the the other team. So um, think about a little bit how you're organizing your 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 workers so that to make sure that you can still operate in case uh, some get affected. The third point is really around uh, how many of them had brought in uh, new technology to um, to help. I mean, clearly things like order at table it, it is something that a lot of countries are now. Um, uh, recommending that that restaurants do or pubs do, um, uh, but also thinking about like how you can track how your how you, how your team is feeling, uh, making it easier for people to pay by contactless, uh, so that they don't have to touch a, a device. Being able to put QR codes on on the tables to be able to scan that and see see their menu. So anything that can reduce the contact um, and, and just make people feel safer. And really, the th fourth point is thinking about like what the customer journey is like. So um, th this starts at home. Uh, you know, they're thinking about going out. Do I want to uh, risk going out to a restaurant? Uh, can I sit outside? Uh, will I be able to order using an app? Uh, can I click and collect? 
so really thinking about each point and in particular the communication around it for for for, for your team and also for your for, for for the punters because the more you communicate with them the more reassured they'll feel and the more they'll feel like oh, it's worth me going out i know what they're doing in terms of pr uh, protecting me and, and protecting the team and um, so those were, were some of the the, the the main key learnings um, and before I wrap up, I, I just wanted to say a point around, um, I'm, I'm hoping one thing that comes out of this, uh, around the um, this crisis, and, and obviously it's affected the industry ter ter terribly, is that it helps redefine a little bit the relationship between landlords and tenants, and also between the government and the industry. I think in the past, uh, bo both the governments and, and landlords have um, uh, uh, treated restaurants as um, as an industry where they could collect revenue quite easily, um, and I hope that they understand that this is such a fundamental part to the community, and that they 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 rethink about that that relationship and and uh, uh, make it so that they are more supportive, and that we 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 see the restaurant industry thrive again. That's it for me. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks again, Christian. Um, some great insight from, from the data and, and really interesting comparisons from, from, from other markets. And I think I share that um, about landlords and the government. Um, it'd be, and it'd be really interesting to hear our other speakers' thoughts and findings against that, that backdrop. Um, and I'm sure the audience will, will have some questions for you a bit later on. Um, so just a reminder on that, you can add your questions on Slido. Just open up a, a browser or use your phone. It's sly.do um, and then just enter in the code as unusual. Um, I can see we've got three questions in there already. So, so please do log in and, and get involved. Um, so just to sum up quickly there after Christian, there's you know some really great insight there, which, which clearly highlights that businesses will have to continue to adapt as we go through this, this slow process of, of reopening and, and, and instilling confidence back in customers. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Dom? Thank you. Um, right, so now we have three new speakers. Here we have Sharon. Claudio and Carl. So it would be great to get all of your, your advice from, from your different angles. If we start with Sharon, just next slide, please. And um, thank you. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Um, so you work with, with a lot of hospitality businesses providing financial education. So I'm, I'm really interested to, to hear about the impact of recent events on, on employees financial health and well-being and, and, and possibly how businesses can address that moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, um, greetings from a very warm Buckinghamshire here today. Um, nice to meet you all. Um, just very briefly about me, uh, worked in media and advertising for 30 years. Um, and I suppose the thing that I bring to the table today is that was managing very large teams, often of very young people, and moved into to the area that I work in now about 18 months ago. I've spent the last 18 months working around Europe, um, went across to the States to understand the pay revolution out there, um, but particularly in the UK. Um, and Hasty was founded because our founder worked in hospitality, still does, and has a business that puts 20,000 people out to work in hospitality um, every day when life is normal. Um, so I'd like to think there's hopefully lots of things I can share about how we built our business on the back of how we could support hospitality. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, we talk at the moment about business as unusual, um, and I think the one thing that is usual and is normal and the thing that we hopefully care about as much as everything else is our people. Um, and what we would like to talk to you about today is about how we can still help your workers be very mentally present. Um, as Kevin just said then, the reduced financial stress, I don't think anyone has seen themselves or people around them affected so deeply by changes to their finances. Um, and then you as a business, you know, how can we support you and your people without impacting your cash flow? There's enough pressure um, on us all at the moment uh, without the, the cash flow impact. And then also, how can we, we get our workers working to their very full capacity? So if we could jump to the next slide, um, you may well have seen that the Joseph Browntree Foundation and the Resolution Foundation have been on the news an awful lot, an awful lot lately. Um, they're an independent social change organisation and they work to solve UK poverty. 
Um, and interestingly, we have only been paid the way we've been paid since the 1960s. And that's when the Payment of Wages Act went through, which allowed employers like us um, to pay our employees by cheque monthly, which we as employees probably didn't like very much, but the banks thought was fabulous. So there's quite a recent change. And what we're seeing, and I think Christian mentioned the government there and some changes he hoped to see, is that there is a great lobbying act now coming forward. And the Joseph Rowntree Foundation really want to see how people are, are paid to change. So they're saying here that 17% of workers are paid weekly. And I would say hospitality is one of the best sectors for that but still three quarters are being paid monthly and what that means is such a substantial impact on cash flow and we as employees are effectively lending money to our employers and that makes our own liquidity pretty tricky to manage so if we could jump to the next slide then Rishi has got involved and Phil Willis, and they also have talked about the difference between keeping heads above water and the life on benefits. When Rishi made this quote, it's about a month ago now, that it was across you know, some of the front pages, he was talking about people had to get paid when they needed to get paid. Now that's a massive statement and quite a tricky thing to do, but you can see this surge of people recognizing that one of the ways we're gonna come out of this the other side is to allow people some choice about when they receive their money. Um, it goes without saying that the outside of hospitality, our UK hospitals, an area that we work deeply with, um, has put food banks in nearly every hospital across the UK during this period. And I think that sums up just how awful this crisis has been. So if we could move to the next slide. So we run workplace wellbeing studies. They're totally independent. They're not about what we're trying to find out. They're just understanding, you know, a touch paper of what's happening around organisations. As I said, our largest, our largest sector is hospitality. Um, and you can see that this is pre-COVID. So pre-COVID, 74% of workers were affected by personal finance related stress. And 27% said how much it impacted their work. What we know from the people we talk to is that while people may be present in your organizations and your places of work, they're often not actually present in their thinking because they're so worried about their financial status. So if we can move across to the next slide. So what this is trying to show, I suppose, is that there is an underground movement here. It started in the States about six years ago. There's about 10 companies that support this around the world now. And that the workers were saying pre-COVID, please, you know, can you support me in having access to my money when I need it on demand? The government have now flagged this as critical. Um, and we're now seeing, you know, UK poverty led social change organization saying it's time that we see some significant change for our people. So if we can jump to the next slide, I won't bore you with lots of stats. I can share this afterwards if any of you would like to see it. Um, but 43% of workers um, won't come and ask you. So we know with lots of our hospitality clients that you are among the best. When someone knocks on your door and says, I need hundred pounds, I'm desperate, you, you go above and beyond. Um, but for every one, we know that feels you know, brave enough to ask, there are seven that don't. So there's a huge amount of workers that really are sat on the sidelines and not able to tell you quite what a critical place they're in. So if we could move across to the next slide. So this is a financial epidemic and I, and I won't take you through all of it, but you know, pre-COVID again, I say 33% of UK households would not be able to have afforded an unexpected bill and look how different our circumstances are now. Um, and 75% of workers admit that their mental health has been affected by financial stress. We've just conducted our last wellbeing survey. We've done that through the course of July and August, so during COVID, and those answers will be out in September. So I very happily will share them with Kevin um, and can share out to you what this crisis looks like post, you know, post this latest wellbeing study. So if we could move across to the next slide. So I think you know better than anyone, I don't need to tell you this, just how much it hurts you when people aren't financially present, when they're worried about their money. The average cost to a small UK um, independent business can be £12,000 to replace a member of staff. You know, financial stress, again, pre this, was costing the UK economy £120 billion. So there's a huge impact on all of us, um, on top of everything else we're doing with the current times, to look at our people and see how we can help them through this time. So if we move to the next slide. So this is kind of me wrapping up for you really now. Uh, we, we have worked with lots of people across hospitality. We work with the Verga company. Um, and I always think it's better for someone else to tell you what it meant to their staff rather than me. 
But what he's very happy about is to say that making ends meet in London was already incredibly difficult for us all. And they've been looking for a long time for a solution like this. And they came across us. As I say, there's about 10 of us around the world now. There's a couple of us in the UK. And it's made a huge difference to them. And they're very happy with the service it's offered their people so far. So if we go to the last slide. So cash flow is definitely more important than ever. ever. Earnings on demand is a movement. It's, um, it's been across the pond for a long time, but the fact our government are getting behind it, you know, really important charities are getting behind it. Um, I think now is really a time to take stock of how people really need to be paid in the future. Companies like ours, how do they help you? They are the banks, they fund it all for you. It doesn't impact your cash flow and it just enables your people to access money when they need it. So to my last slide, I was one ahead of myself, this is my last slide. Um, so we work with lots of people across hospitality. Uh, I know we've made a difference, we're very proud of that. We consider ourselves a really ethical business. And I suppose my point is that if nothing else from today, and I think you all do this incredibly well in your sector anyway, please put your people first. Please think about what they're facing when they're at home and the worries they have and how financial education and access to their money is so important. And if me or any of our clients can talk you through any more of that, we'd be super happy to do so post this event. So thank you so much for your time. Over to you, Kevin. Awesome. Thank you, Sharon. Um, some pretty worrying but but very insightful stats there. Um, and as Sharon said, I'll just, just remind everyone that, that we will share a recording of this session and all the slides with you afterwards. So you can refer back to, to any of this um, important information. Um, so a quick change of lineup, I believe, um, the beauty of a, a live webinar, but I think one of our speakers is having some technical difficulties. So um, I'm going to move swiftly on to um, Carl. Um, Carl is from HFTP. Um, and hi, Carl. Um, I know I know you're a, a very well networked individual in the in the hotel sector. Um, and I've been listening to to some of your webinars over the last few months. So I know you've got some some great insight, specifically related to to hotels and their unique challenges at, at this time. So. Um, over to you, Carl. Thank you very much. Uh, if we can move on to the first slide, please. Okay, so um, my background is that um, I've been in hotels longer than most people I know because I was actually born in one um, and been one in all my life as my parents ran hotels, owned hotels. Um, but the last 15 years or so, I've been in the association business with Hospa in the UK and HFTP in the US where we run the largest hospitality technology show in the world called High Tech. So five minutes or just a little bit more on hotels. Um, as a business, what the issues are now, what hotels look like post COVID, what will people expect of their experience in hotels and how to build a long-term and safe relationship with hotels uh, customers when they come back. Next slide, please. Okay, so comparing hotels to pubs and restaurants, I just want you to think a little bit about the fact that hotels generically or tend to be big buildings that have rooms and accommodation. This means they can be let short term or long term. Um, in that sense, they're a bit like an airline or a train. They can only let those rooms tonight for tonight. If they don't sell them tonight, they can't sell them again for tonight. So they're perishable in that sense. They have restaurants and bars like most of our audience. So in that sense, they're a bit like manufacturing in the sense that they take ingredients and turn them around into something else, or they're like retail in that they take a bottle of wine and resell it at the table or over the bar. But they also have things like function and meeting spaces, and they have leisure and spa, in which case they're a bit like either the actual meeting and events business, or they're a bit like retail. So with that in mind, next slide, please. Now, these hotels, they have uh, travellers uh, coming to stay with them. Uh, I just want you to think about four, um, four sections of a box, if you like. They have international versus national, or if you like, national versus domestic, to use a United States phrase. 
And these travellers have different issues in different ways. And then the other slice through travellers is the fact that they may be on leisure and they may be staying with families. They may be at a resort or they may be on business, in which case they have a different set of needs. They expect Wi-Fi, they expect room service and all those kinds of things. Hotels are having to deal with all these kinds of things and different people will behave even in this environment in different ways. And then hotels in terms of their rooms have got to think about their booking channels such as OTA. So how do many how, how many of you have the book through Expedia or booking.com or hotels.com or anything similar to that? And those those companies um, they market hotels, but they charge a commission for them, and hotels have to pay that cost. And they would prefer most hotels to actually have people book direct with them, but they don't necessarily have the distribution. Um, there's a lower percentage uh, commission, but they have to build their own website and their own booking engines. And for that, they may well have um, somebody called a revenue manager. Revenue management's been around about 15, 20 years, came from the airlines and came from railways. And basically, this is the um, art or science that flexes your room rates, um, depending on how far out you're booking and what's going on. And then at the same time, hotels are now having to compete with things such as Airbnb. Next slide, please. Then the other issues, conferences and events. Uh, I was listening to a hotel FD the other day saying he had a, a room that was previously uh, set as a capacity of 400, now will be set for 80. Um, their large spaces will be severely restricted if used at all. Hotels as a rule have been low tech, I say as a rule, because they've been slow to embrace technology. And then ownership and funding models in the industry have been very, very strange, very fractured. I don't know, you may have read about Travel Lodge. They were all leased properties. They're all in trouble now, possibly being taken over by Accor, amongst other things. And possibly also ownership in terms of, I may own a hotel, but Kevin may be running it for me, and that's called a management contract. Or you may run a franchise such as Best Western. So going forward to the next slide, please. So the future of hotels, post COVID, if there is such a thing, and it's still a year away in my opinion, cleaning, cleaning standards. There may be multiple cleaning standards. If you are a branded.com hotel in London, you may have to have the branded uh, cleaning standard. You may have to visit Britain standards. You may have the AA, the RAC standard, a number of others, all multiple cleaning standards, all with a slightly different variation. The guests will expect contactless, or to use United States phrase, they will expect touchless con uh, technology. And they will expect that for check-in, passport scanning, checkout, payments, door locks, and food and beverage orders. They will not expect to have to touch anything or move something over on a piece of paper. Staff, as we talked about earlier, will also expect to be communicated with te via technology and digitally. That means hotels and their businesses need to get into the cloud. They're looking at uses of their buildings, whether they want to run all the food and beverage. They may be looking at outsourcing some of their um, food and beverage areas to specialists who are specializing in doing F&B in hotels. There will be more room service. There will be no more breakfast buffets. There will be controlled breakfast, which is actually panacea for hotels, controlling the breakfast as opposed to everybody coming down at nine o'clock on a Saturday. And the actual use of their buildings, whether they will be long term or short term or apartments or even offices. In one hotel I was in, um, we actually had offices where they created the original spitting image um, puppets a uh, long, long time ago. Next slide, please. So the experience people will expect, they will expect cleaning standards and want to know which one you're using or which ones. They will expect communication, uh, the guests before they arrive, what the what you're doing. They will expect a degree of personalization in terms of the, um, what they're expecting. They won't expect a blanket email. They will expect some technology and the community that the hotel is working and living in. They will be judging the hotel locally as well in terms of the kinds of people that are staying in the hotel. So taking all that in mind, the next slide, please. This is what I believe the guests will be expecting long term. They would expect personalization on their communications one on one as to what they are staying, depending on whether they're an international or whether they're business or whether they're leisure. They will expect communications on a regular basis, and this applies to customers and staff. 
they will expect Wi-Fi and they will expect it free. Wi-Fi 6 is a new standard coming very soon, if not imminent, which will make the move from uh, actual Wi-Fi to the networks and back again a lot easier. And they will expect to be able to use that without having to think about it. They will expect hotels to walk the talk. You can tell them about all the standards, but they will be watching to see what you do. And they will ex be watching to see that in terms of whether they come back next time. Business and leisure travellers will behave differently and have different concerns. The age groups will have different concerns and will behave differently in your hotel. And all of these people will expect technology solutions now. They will expect it mobile and they will expect it in a contactless way via technology. And if you would like to contact me and get a hold of me or know more about high tech and HFTP, there is my contact details on the next slide. Thank you very much, Kevin. Over to you. Super, thank you, Carl. Um, it does feel like an even bigger challenge, I think, for, for the hotel sector when you think about the impact of, of international travel and you know, large gatherings, events, conferences, and, and, and the like. Um, so I do believe we might have had a, a live substitution going on while, while Carl was speaking. I, I think Claudio is currently in an area that's experiencing some, some pretty bad thunderstorms. So I think his, uh, his network has gone down. So either myself or I think actually his colleague Isabel is, uh, is going yeah. to take his place and, uh, and go through his, his slides for us. Exactly. Thank, you. Thank you, Isabel. Yes, uh, hello, this is a bit last minute, but um, so I'll be taking over for uh, Claudio today. Um, he is our senior partner manager in UK and Ireland, uh, but I'm uh, the marketing uh, person in the, at Deliberact. Um, so I'm going to present to you a little bit more about how managing your delivery platforms and uh, what the best practices on that aspect are. So um, first of all, um, Deliveract um, is uh, going to give you a little bit more information about this. Uh, so some best practices on uh, your uh, delivery is it's very important to make sure that you select the right audience and match up with your brand. So if you have a um, pizza brand, you have a totally different audience than, you know, if you have a healthy salad bar. Um, so make sure that you, you select that audience uh, well and that you know what type of communication to do towards them and um, how to target them that uh, the audience that you select is aligned with uh, your brand uh, your brand building and so on then it's also important to market your deliveries so sometimes uh, people are not aware that your restaurant is um, on a certain platform uh, that you're uh, make sure that you communicate that on your social media that you are on Deliveroo, on Uber Eats, uh, on Just Eat, any of these platforms, which is really important. Um, then um, another important aspect is that you prepare your logistics. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, once once it's uh, in the heat of the moment, you have a lot of um, online orders coming in. It's it's always nice to have the preparation of all these. Um, you know, if you have a salad bar to have all the bowls already uh, set up and then just fill them at the moment the new orders are coming in. And then, um, of course, uh, being able to have the perfect uh, delivery tech uh, to um, support that kind of operation is very important as well. So making sure that, you know, um, you have everything aligned uh, and that uh, at a peak time, uh, I don't know, six o'clock in the evening, uh, when all orders come in, that you are in charge of the operations, that you handle it very well and that you manage it uh, correctly. Okay, so next uh, slides. Um, it's about the omni channel approach. Uh, we see that, you know, especially during these times, it's, it's very important to be uh, present on uh, multiple platforms, on, on multiple. Um, uh, yeah, to, to have multiple ways on how to really um, access uh, your customers. Um, so we've seen a lot of our customers uh, kind of flipping over um, their their uh, their marketing mix, or I would say, or their operational mix. Um, so it's important to know that each 
each channel is different. You know, you have a different audience going to um, a Deliveroo um, kind of platforms, or you have a different audience going, um, being able to do a QR. Or uh, we see a lot of um, restaurants doing that as well now. Um, and of course, um, people need to adjust to that. So um, it's very important to know that there's a different um, approach to each channel. Um, and make sure that you analyze um, what audience, the, uh, like that you analyze well, what kind of um, channel you can use for the audience that you're targeting towards. Um, and then you can uh, rate them um, on what they offer, the network that they have, um, their commission, the customer base, and so on. Um, I would say the more channels, the more reach. So of course, it's uh, don't don't put all your eggs in one basket. I would say so. Make sure to be on on multiple uh, of these platforms and on multiple of these um, ways of of getting towards your customer. Um, and that's also important because you wanna stay kind of independent. You don't wanna rely on that one platform on that one online uh, well channel uh, towards your customers. So uh, make sure that you, that you have that volume, that redundancy. Um, and then, uh, which was really good as well is to have your, to create your own web shop or your click and collect um just it's really good for your branding as well making sure that your name's out there um, and it also is an, an an additional channel to to reach your customers uh, and uh, we have an example of one of our customers there uh, which is absurbird uh, they are on delivery uh, on uber eats so on third-party platforms they also have their own web shop, uh, web shop um and um some of our customers also have the qr table ordering um and the self-ordering kiosk so it's it's really good to have all this information or all this kind of um con touch points with your customer um uh, and have that all in one system uh, to manage that from uh, in a good uh, and efficient way okay and then we have our last slide. Yeah. So very important as well. Um, what do you put on your menu? What What do you put on that online menu? Um, I think it's it's important to, to think that through. Just don't copy paste your in house or your in restaurant menu um, online. Um, make sure that uh, you you have a menu that is manageable. Um, what do I want to say with this? It, sometimes the orders come in very, very quickly at the peak, the rush time. And then um, if you have on your menu, you have this very specific um, dish that takes a lot of time to prepare, it's not gonna be scalable. So make sure to trim your menu and the, ideally you have between 15 and 20 options. Um, also because people like to have options, but if you have such an extensive menu, kind of it's, it's going to be too much anyway um and of course pictures are well they are very convincing so we know that if you have uh very nice pictures of the food with clear descriptions on what's in there um that uh convinces a lot of customers as well and finally consider your pricing um based on your food cost overhead uh, cost and the delivery expenses to make sure that at the end of the day you're still making profit with these uh, online sales of course um yes that's that's a bit what uh what i wanted to say kevin i don't know if you have any questions uh for me no just a, a massive round of applause and thank you for for stepping in at, at such short notice there i think uh yeah. claudio um owes you a massive yeah. drink i think for, for, for doing that um, i will so, i will um i don't know yeah um so no th thank you for that so um time for for the q a session um please feel free to to, to stick around isabel um as we welcome the other speakers back mm -hmm. um just missing christian there he is um so thanks everyone um
for, for all your input. Um, so, and, and, and thanks to everyone also who's who's put their questions into, into Slido. Um, there's still time to, to add questions um, and vote on those that, that you would like answered. Um, so I'm just going to start with with one that was asked in the in the kind of the the pre-event questionnaire um, that I think is relevant for for everyone on the panel, and that's is there a danger that technology will will get in the way of the business and service of hospitality? And I, th I think that's an interesting question, and it, I'll I'll come to you in a second, Christian, if you don't mind, because. Um, I was listening to your your podcast just last week. I can't remember the chap's name, but he was running the Singapore operation for Fernando's, um, and he had a really interesting approach in terms of how to look at this. And it was very much a, a kind of a value based approach um, in terms of you know if if the human interaction element, if those points of, of human touch adds value to the customer experience, then it should remain that way. Um, in answer to the question myself, I do think that there's a danger that you know technology could get in the way of service, but I think it's it, it's very much dependent on the particular business um, and, and and the way that you frame that. Um, anything to add to that, perhaps, Christian? Yeah, no, I I, uh, I agree with you uh, wholeheartedly on that. I think that as as always, there's there's a risk of putting too much technology. Uh, maybe in in some places, but uh, but uh, uh, clearly this is uh, as as you've named this uh, podcast series, uh, this webinar series is like business as unusual. So things will have to change, and and there's going to be a huge amount of help from from technology. But uh, I think it's important the point he was making about putting um, emoji was putting uh, on um, on values and making sure that you you know what your values are and and, and that that fits in with that. Uh, that that will be fundamental. I, I do think things like order at table, uh, helping uh, get the delivery orders uh, into into your till, like Deliverect are doing, um, being able to 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 uh, optimize how you get your reporting out of system so that you can get that faster and can react faster, like with things like Tenzo could do. Uh, I think those are like places where restaurants will uh, see huge amounts of benefits from from the from technology. Thank you, Christian. And perhaps, Carl, anything sort of specific from, from, from the hotel sector? Yeah, um, I think it's all about touch points. Um, and I think there'll be a period of time, possibly 18 months, even two years, where people will s seriously want their touch points reduced. So if you go up to a hotel, you don't want to give your passport over, see it taken away, stuck in a photocopier, brought back. Do you want to swap down your own passport? No, you want to put it into a scanner. The scanner scans it. The technology takes it away. Do you really want a key which has been touched by multiple people? No, you don't. You really would rather the key sent to your phone and your phone opens things, opens the lift, does things like that. Um, you'd rather order your room service by going onto an app and ordering it through the room. Um, you'd rather the the hotel know that your tray is outside its door. Um, you'd rather not have to give them your credit card. You'd rather have um, the touchless payment and the authorization done before. Um, and all those kinds of things where there's a hygiene factor which will, be, which will be highlighted seriously in the next two years. And I think the more technology and the easier it is to deal with it, also from a staff point of view, where they don't have to touch anything or sign anything will be very important going forward. Awesome, thank you, thank you, Carl. Um, and I've got one sort of obvious question here for for you, Sharon, um, and that is, um, how are staff better off by being paid weekly versus monthly? Sharon, are you on mute? Ah, sorry, I was being kept quiet. <laughs> it happens a lot of times in my life. Um, so I, I think um, how people can can benefit from being paid weekly. I mean, we've seen it firsthand across multiple organisations um, and all over the world now. It just empowers people 
um, being paid monthly is is so, you know, just to your points, Carl, actually, I was listening to that and thinking, my goodness, you know, how the world has moved on and so much has moved on and we're very responsive now and expecting things quite instantaneously and yet we wait 30 days for our pay so being paid weekly what we see is it, it may encourages people to do more for their employer because guess what it's really exciting to me to work on thursday if i get that money thursday night and not in 25 days time so there's there's a, a massive shift in how more people want to work from you and then there's just a general empowerment that people know that every day or every week they've got money in an app they need to use it Sorry, you can hear me twice, can't you? It's okay. Better than better than not hearing you, you at all. So. <laughs> um, yeah, it's we've we've seen you know enormous strides forward, and the whole point of giving people access to their money is choice and empowerment, and making sure they don't have to turn to high cost credit. That's that's the thing we care about most. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, and I think here's uh, the most popular question here on, on Slido, um, asked by Lana. Thank you, Lana. Um, a great share of hospitality industry is allocated to street food stalls, trailers, and farmers markets. What does the future hold for them and how can they survive? I think it's a, I think it's a, a good point. Um, obviously with with large events and music festivals and concerts and so on or not not taking place at the moment um those sort of traders are going to have to find other ways to to survive really but i have seen some some pretty innovative uses of of um sort of food stalls um done by restaurants and so on in, in the recent months um anyone want to to jump in on that one I can just add from a personal level, if you talk about the one thing that's really struck the chord with everybody is community throughout this crisis um, and us looking after our local hospitality outlets and one of ours turned into a green grocers and is just reopening tonight but the one thing that kept going was the local markets so our farmers market our local normal market and the food trucks all came into town you know they came in and they were doing pizzas on a thursday to a saturday night so the thing that i've seen as a consumer is i think they really rode this well certainly in, around my area and they embraced themselves directly into their community and i think that that will really pay dividends for them moving forward yeah absolutely absolutely agree and what, what about you christian uh, you know you've you've heard from the likes of um barack on your podcast who is doing some some interesting work um um and, and such like and any any sort of any interesting things you've seen there for for sort of street food and so on yeah, I, I, um, uh, I, I'll echo what Sharon was saying, really, because uh, Barack, who, who, who runs now a, a, like a, a couple of restaurants in, in North London, has really, uh, he, he right at the beginning of the pandemic, he went out to a lot of the neighbours around the, both restaurants to ask, uh, to say, hey, listen, we can help with anything. If you need us to bring us groceries, if you need us to go and walk your dog, if you're self-isolating and, 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 and um, and vulnerable you know we can we can help you in all these ways and um he really uh, built this sense of community where everyone w w was helping each other out and when he where, and as he uh, that's really helped his his business uh, as well uh, which was incredibly heartwarming to see so i think uh, a lot about reaching out to a community i'd also say turn to, turn to deliveries a lot of people are at home wanting to get the the the, the food they 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 usually want to get and and can, can order it in and and a lot of people are still going to stay on this delivery so so jump on that uh, get, you know anyone can do it really um so I'd I'd really recommend doing that awesome thank you thank you Christian um just looking through the the questions on Slido here um. Perhaps one for you here, here Carl, and um, relating to bigger spaces and, and, and businesses. What advice do you have for, for weddings and, and larger parties? Well, the first thing is to keep an eye on the rules um, because they are forever changing depending on whether you're in England, Scotland or Wales. Um, I think 
the, the thing for hotels um, and places with 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 events, they've got a long lead time. So to some extent, they're going to have to set their lead time and uh, and and be careful. And you're going to have to gamble at a certain point. You're also going to have to gamble with the spacing. Um, I've seen some profitability charts showing, you know, the difference in profitability between having a one meter, one and a half meter, and a two meter distancing. And you're going to have to be adaptable um, because the rules may change depending on second wave and all those things. I think echoing, uh, I think a little bit about um, what what Claudio <laughs> was saying earlier on. You're going to have to adapt your mem your um, or its replacement uh, was going to have was saying about menus. Um, hotels in food and beverage really make money out of breakfast and banqueting, and banqueting is pre-ordered, pre-menued food. Um, don't get too clever with it. Keep it very simple um, uh, uh, because, you know, you can't have fancy stuff. You're going to have to cook it for, you know, a number of different people. You're going to have to allow three or four times the space. If you've got open space like you do, if you do weddings, you're probably going to have a lawn and things like that. You're going to have to be very creative as a hotel. I may be staying in September who's changed their pub and their restaurant into their pub and restaurant together. So be creative with your space. Look at it from the customer's point of view. Restrict your numbers and keep an eye on the regulations on a regular basis. Thank you, Carl. Um, need to get you involved here, Isabel. Um, I was just wondering if you could potentially maybe talk us through the, the difference between click and collect and versus delivery from a from a kind of uh, business functionality point of view. Uh, is Isabel muted? Am I unmuted now? Yeah, you're good now. Um, so I think um, to have a click and collect, it's always really nice to have because um, you uh, you have your own uh, web shop or a site where customers can go towards directly and order from there. Um, and um, I think in any way, it's it's good that people can still uh, pass by your venue and just um, make sure to make clear that you do respect the rules, that you do have, um, you know, um, wearing a mask, ma uh, the masks and, and things like that, that you still have that in place. Um, but it's it's good to have that uh, in your mix as well to make sure that you are a little bit independent from these third party delivery platforms uh, because uh, that's mostly your own um, income and that is 100% for yourself uh, in most of the cases. Um, so that's a, a really good add on for your uh, omni channel mix. And I think in particularly when when we were all locked down as, as the person posing the question here says it's it was a, a bit of an event just to just to go out on a drive and to collect your food <laughs> rather than have it delivered to your yeah. house um, uh, so we've got got one for you here and um, directed to you christian specifically from from danny um and that is do, do you think this time is also an opportunity for for businesses to rethink about reducing food waste uh, yeah, uh, de definitely. I, uh, so my my my, uh, uh, my background, having run restaurants before, I was I was shocked at the amount of food that that uh, restaurants as a whole waste. So just to give you an idea, it's, there's 1.6 billion tons of food wasted annually in the world, and 600 million tons of that is restaurants. Um, and put to put that in perspective, um, the aid that's typically distributed to say Yemen uh, and Syria. A year is six million. So a hundred times what we distribute in aid is wasted by restaurants. Um, and and my 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 perspective on this is that uh, a, a big reason for this waste is that um, restaurants do not typically have tools to help them predict future sales um, accurately. Um, and there are now uh, there is technology out there to pr help you predict future sales using machine learning, weather events. Um, and by using these tools, you can you can actually get a much more accurate forecast. So um, and and up to 70% more accurate. Uh, so I would urge anyone to 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 look into this because um, the margins are going to get even tighter in in the restaurant space. Uh, and this is 
uh, an easy, uh, well, is a low hanging fruit for restaurants and for, for you know for communities at large and and to reduce food waste so uh yes totally think this is a good opportunity to to really look at that so cool. thank you christian I'm really something? oh sorry carl could i add something to that two things firstly back to mine and isabel's point about reducing your menus if you're not careful and you give your chef all the options he'll have multiple stuff on his menus restrict your menus that will restrict the food waste exactly as christian said and the other thing is, if you're doing more delivery, taking more online orders, you're now coming into that area which hotels have discovered subsequent to airlines and trains of revenue management, because all your data is coming into a funnel and you can look at what is happening by analysing your data. So are more steaks ordered on a Saturday night than on a Sunday? So you don't need to order the same amount of meat for a Sunday as you do on a Saturday. You can look at these trends and your ordering can come, become more accurate and also your pricing can be flex, which is what room room price uh, room pricing, airline pricing does. It looks at peak demands, and you can affect demand by pricing. And I think the mixture of those two has surely got to help the industry um, on on wastage. Awesome, thank you, Carl. And at the risk of running two minutes over, I just want, I just want to finish on a, a really positive point from from each of you. Um, and that is, what is it that makes you feel positive about the future of our industry? And I'll, I'll, I'll start with Sharon. Um, what makes me feel positive are the people, the people that are on the ground doing the work and the people that are running it. And I think, you know, through all of these things, and, it, and it's almost slightly wartime, isn't it? But, you know, the best of people has been seen through this as well. So that's what makes me positive. People are clever um, and I think they will come out of this. I hope, uh, with lots of lessons learned, but really strong, and they've really looked after each other. So, oh, and Carl? Oh, have we got Carl? I'll go to Christian. Yeah, Carl's looking very, very still. Um, <laughs> yes, I uh, uh, totally agree with your points, Sharon. I, I would add on that, that the restaurant industry survived the last pandemic uh, and actually i think a lot of what the government and landlords are starting to do uh, is is not only going to help um, during the pandemic and the fact that you know they've not just helped once they've 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 tried uh, with the furlough scheme with the eat uh, eat out to help out and um, the the business rates etc so i think and you know the 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 queen's estate doing a turnover rent so there is fundamental change happening i hope that it stays after this and that the, the and this would make this industry even stronger as it was that we went into the pandemic so yeah very very hopeful on that and our super sub isabel yeah i think a positive note is that people are getting really creative uh, which i love to see that um, people are finding new initiatives um making um a creative way to 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 get in touch with our customers uh, or uh, to help out the staff uh, so I think there's a lot of um, innovation coming for the hospitality industry, um, and I'm curious to see what's coming. Amazing. Thank you, Isabel. And Carl, I think we've got you back. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Disappeared off. You all went still for a moment, and then I realised it was me. Um, um, I, am, I am encouraged by the fact that people want to travel, they want to get out, they want to experience hospitality. Um, um, especially delivery. I was at a friend's house over the weekend in North Wales. They had food delivered in. It was absolutely amazing from this restaurant. And I think we as an industry will have to adapt. Two years from now, we may be back and it may be different. The travel, I think there'll be more. Um, the Americans have a phrase, the drive to locations. We're going to get more um, delivery, more experience at home. It's going to be different, but people want to experience hospitality in all its ways. Whether there'll be international hospitality as much as there ever was, I'm not really sure. But I think within our national boundaries, um, I think people and the public want to experience hospitality, and I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Some nice, positive messages to, to finish on. Uh, apologies for, for running slightly over, but I just want to finish by saying thank you to all of our speakers thank you to everyone for listening and um, there are some unanswered questions left on slido so we'll, we'll do our best to sort of answer those in the in the follow-up um, we will share the the recording and all of the the slides etc with with you all afterwards as well so um thank you all very much